Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Novel Applications of Automated Electrophysiology and Ion Channel Drug Discovery. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Molecular Devices. Molecular Devices is one of the world's leading providers of high-performance bioanalytical measurement solutions for life science research, pharmaceutical, and biotherapeutical development. Included within a broad product portfolio are platforms for high-throughput patch clamp electrophysiology and axon instruments conventional electrophysiology products. These leading-edge products empower scientists to improve productivity and effectiveness, ultimately accelerating research and the discovery of new therapeutics. Before we start, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers are always welcome, too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. If you want a better look, you can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's presenters, Dr. Rock Cern and David Wei. Dr. Rock Cern is a principal research scientist at Eli Lilly and Company, where he supports drug discovery projects with ion channel assays and expertise. Prior to Eli Lilly, Rock was at Redpoint Bio, where he focused on discovery of novel TRP channel modulators, and at Purdue Pharma, where he supported the discovery of novel pain therapeutics. At Purdue, his group was among the first to introduce automated electrophysiology, which gave him an opportunity to create software development for the Patch Express system. Dr. David Way is a research scientist leading the Ion Channel Services Group at Eurofin Pan Labs. There, he serves as a principal investigator for oversight of ion channel drug discovery and safety assessment projects, including discovery and safety programs for over 60 ion channel targets for more than 300 clients in industry and academia. Prior to joining Eurofins, David worked at other life science companies, including EMD Millipore and Targacept, where he designed and developed the first novel high throughput in vitro slice electrophysiology recording system in support of drug discovery and toxicology programs. I will now turn it over to Dr. Cern and Dr. Wei for their presentation. Uh, thanks for logging in, and thanks to Molecular Devices for giving me the opportunity to talk about our experience with Ironworks Barracuda, uh, more specifically about some of the experimental approaches for voltage-gated ion channels we developed within the last few years. In essence, I will argue that sub-gigaseal automated patch platform Ironworks Barracuda is suitable for testing compounds on modulation of voltage-gated ion channels held in controlled conformation and at steady state. Um, there's approximately 300 genes encoding ion channels. Each gene may have hundreds of SNPs and mutations. Some of them are functionally relevant, and around 100 have been associated with channelopathies. In addition, ion channels can heterooligomerize and form complexes with associated proteins, which can in turn serve as drug targets. The complexity of potential drug ion channel interaction is enormous. Uh, historically, ion channels present a fruitful class of drug targets. This slide lists a few commonly prescribed drugs targeting ion channels. It is noteworthy that most of them are older drugs and nearly all were discovered empirically. Uh, our understanding of ion channels in continuously improving and opening the novel possibilities for rational drug discovery approaches, for example, genetic mutations such, for example, uh, SIP or erythromyalgia point to NAV17 as a target for pain therapy. Uh, snail toxin-derived peptide, zeconotide, 
uh, clinically validates anti-calcium channel as a target for pain. Uh, the target-based ion channel drug discovery efforts were, however, so far not very successful, and this is reflected in a few new approved drugs targeting ion channels and lack of return on investment and then shift of research and discovery investment away from ion channel research. In some cases, whole therapeutic areas with substantial amount of ion channel targets get deprioritized. Uh, while the industry struggles with bringing new ion channel drugs to market, the scientific advances in our understanding of ion channel structure and function uh, advance rapidly. This is to a large degree due to technological breakthroughs, such as the ability to solve crystal structure for ion channels. Uh, the example on the left shows, uh, this is from Genentech Burke, shows the binding of aryl sulfonamide to the binding pocket on the voltage sensor in domain 4 of chimeric NA17. To correctly interpret structure activity relationship and guide compound optimization, functional data are needed as well. The selectivity profile for this aerosol sulfonamide is shown on the right. The data were obtained with manual patch recording where special care was devoted to maintaining the sodium channel isotype in equivalent conformational state. Um, the complexity of ion channel drug interaction and the need for physiological relevance require assays with substantial throughput and good control of ion channel conformation to assure predictive value for, for the downstream in vivo endpoint. Electrophysiology with its ability to control the memory potential with its direct readout and sub-millisecond temporal resolution is often the most suitable technique. The low throughput of manual patch is, however, not adequate for support of industrial drug discovery and automated electrophysiology was introduced within the last 15 years to address this need. In a broad sense, automated electrophysiology instruments can be divided into gigaseal instruments capable of high fidelity voltage clamp and sub-gigaseal instruments with advantage of higher success rate. This talk will focus on Ironworks Barracuda, which was introduced five years ago and follows Ironworks HD and Ironworks Quattro in the line of sub-gigaseal instruments. Um, the main objective of Ironworks Barracuda was to retain the functionality of Ironworks Quattro, primarily the high success rate and stability of recording. A schematic of one of PPC plate wells is on the left, and briefly, at the bottom of each well, there are 64 holes, which get partially or completely occupied by cells on cell addition. Then amphotericine or similar perforating agents is perfused, from the bottom, establishing electrical access, and then electrical circuit composed of common ground and individual recording electrode clamps the memory potential and record the current. Recordings at nearly 100% success rate have become a routine, and screening in electrophysiology became feasible. The limitation of Quattro is in a discontinuous voltage clamp, which is a consequence of separate liquidic and electronic hat. Barracuda aims, in addition to meeting what, uh, the capability of Quattro, to overcome these limitations by integrating fluidics and electrophysiological recording as illustrated in the center. Uh, the silver one is the uh, electrode and the bluish is the, uh, the pipette. Uh, and uh, this integration enables continuous clamping of memory potential and recording of current during the compound addition complex voltage clamp protocols and recording of ligand-gated channels became feasible on Ironworks Barracuda. An additional advantage of Ironworks Barracuda is in its parallel 384 well recording compared to sequential 48 channel recording on Quattro, which gives it higher throughput. Um, in our hands, uh, um, uh, Ironworks Quattro was very stable, robust, and excellent for screening purpose. But due to the lack of continuous voltage clamp and its reliance on pulse-based protocols, Ironverse Quattro assays had some limitation in supporting the structure activity relationship, in particular with accurate potency determination of the inactivated state of the channel. Uh, and this was reflected in disconnects between Ironverse Quattro and Patch Express generated IC50 values for a set of screen active compounds as illustrated in this graph. 
In our experience, Patch Express was a better predictor of potency in manual patch and also efficacy in animal models downstream. So uh, we reasoned that the expanded functionality of Ironworks Barracuda may be suitable for the continuous voltage clamp-based protocols such as the ones used on Patch Express in manual patch. In this way, it would be a better predictor of downstream assays while retaining the high throughput of Ironworks Quattro. Uh, this is a look at the NAT17 currents recorded on Ironworks Barracuda in population patch mode. Uh, depolarizing step evokes a current which rapidly activates and inactivates, as shown in A. Uh, the distribution of currents was relatively narrow, as shown in B. Uh, the average amplitude in our hands was around 2.5 nanoamp. Uh, C and D show activation of the current with a threshold at minus 50 millivolts and peak around minus 20. And E and F show inactivation. Uh, with a uh, half inactivation voltage of minus 50 millivolts. Uh, overall, the properties of NAV17 current recorded on Ironworks Barracuda looked comparable to the properties of NAV17 currents recorded in manual patch. Uh, to accurately evaluate the effect of compounds on defined conformational state of the channel, we needed to assure that the biophysical properties of the channel remain stable throughout the experimental protocol. For that reason, we monitor channel activation and inactivation at the beginning and at the end of 30-minute recordings. In our initial experiments, uh, we used a uh, cesium fluoride-based internal solution and observed large shift in channel activation and inactivation during the experiment. Uh, later on, uh, we switched to potassium gluconate-based internal solution and added series of wash steps and did dramatically improved stability during individual run and also during the six runs of typical experimental day. Uh, the bar graph down at the bottom show at the beginning and at the end for both uh, activation and inactivation kinetics. Um, Next, we designed a protocol capable of, of assessing the effect of compounds on channel in rested and partially inactivated state using multiple protocol modes of Ironworks Barracuda. Holding potential was initially set to a voltage where most channels were reside in resting state, with protocol one, and current amplitudes in response to 20 millisecond depolarizing steps are plotted in B at the bottom. Next. Uh, once the current was stabilized, we stepped uh, the memory potential to a voltage corresponding to approximately 40% inactivation. This is the protocol called T3 uh, at the top. Uh, and uh, test compounds were added during this step. Finally, we returned to the memory potential, uh, uh, for, to the resting membrane potential, uh, and that is the protocol step four. Uh, block of the partially inactivating potential was measured during protocol three, and resting state block was determined by comparing currents evoked during protocol one and protocol four. Two additional quality control protocols, protocol two and five, were added to monitor uh, NAV17 activation inactivation. Uh, experiments performed in population patch mode uh, uh, patch clamp mode of Ironworks Barracuda are associated with substantial leak current uh, conductance, uncompensated access resistance, and a non-uniform electrical field. Therefore, it was important to evaluate the uniformity of inactivation from well to well and between experiments. The example in this slide illustrates the distribution of inactivation across a typical patch plate. The frequency distribution of inactivation was narrow, as shown in histogram in A, and the spatial distribution of inactivation across the patch plate was uniform, as shown as a heat map in B. We were able to routinely obtain recordings with an average fractional inactivation of approximately 50% and uniform distribution of inactivation. Uh, the key strength of our protocol was its inability to evaluate compound effects at steady state for two different channel conformations. In this example, 
One micromolar tetracaine nearly completely blocked net one salmon currents, a depolarized member potential, and had almost no effect on the channel at the hyperpolarized membrane potential. Uh, from CRCs, we can see that there was approximately 100-fold shift in potency between resting and inactivated state. A similar evaluation was performed for several different sodium channel blockers, and this table compares the data from Ironworks Barracuda and data generated by manual patch uh, electrophysiology. In general, there was a good agreement between the two methods for both compound potency and for state dependency. Um, the Ironworks Barracuda I just described was highly reproducible as illustrated by test retest of 70 compounds. Uh, IC50s were obtained at partially inactivated voltage and the correlation coefficient was 0 0.96. Uh, we uh, further uh, assessed uh, the uh, one, one the key advantage of determining a block at a fixed fractional activation is the ability to directly compare potency of compounds across multiple sodium channel subtypes that may inactivate with different kinetics and across different voltage ranges. A set of sodium channel inhibitors was tested for block of six sodium channel subtypes. Each subtype was depolarized to a holding potential corresponding to 40 to 50 percent inactivation. Uh, most sodium channel inhibitors on this list uh, display similar potency for all channel subtypes, suggesting that fractional occupancy of resting and inactivated state was indeed similar across subtypes. An exception is sulfonamide, which was selective for TTX sensitive sodium channel subtypes over TTX resistant NE15. Uh, our Ironworks Barracuda also provided useful information about the kinetics of compound association and this is dissociation from the target. Figure A and B illustrate the fast kinetics of association and dissociation for lidocaine and relatively slow kinetic for sulfonamide. Summary data for a set of eight compounds is in the table below. In conclusion, uh, it is likely the development of sodium channel modulator with superior therapeutic window will require good selectivity, strong state dependence, and an optimal kinetic profile. Uh, the assays I just described can support a drug discovery program by providing information on all these three attributes at the throughput required for industrial drug discovery project. Um, so, we next examine the design of a similar concatenated protocol to measure block of calcium current and encountered some unexpected difficulties. This slide illustrates barium current conducted uh, by recombinant uh, N-type calcium channel and recorded on Ironworks Barracuda in population patch clamp mode. Similar to what is seen in manual electrophysiology recordings, the current activated rapidly and inactivated slightly during the depolarizing pulse. The current voltage relationship shows a relatively steep voltage dependence of current activation, most likely resulting from imperfect voltage control on Ironworks Barracuda. However, the stability over time was excellent. Steady state inactivation uh, was examined with a series of one-second conditioning pulses, followed by a test pulse to zero millivolt, as shown in B. Fitting the Boltzmann equation to the test pulse amplitudes indicated a half inactivation voltage of approximately 20 milliv minus 20 millivolts. Similar to the voltage dependence of activation, steady state inactivation was stable in time. The protocol for assessment of compound effect on channels in resting and inactivated state was similar to the concatenated protocol I just described for sodium channels, so I will not go in detail. Similar to the sodium channel protocol, 
This protocol had the ability to determine compound effect on channels in resting and inactivated states within the same recording. Example in B shows that one micromolar trox has little effect on current evoked from hyperpolarized membrane potential, but almost completely block currents from evoked from the more depolarized membrane potential. Uh, in CRC curves, we can see that uh, there was approximately 100-fold shift in potency. Um, although initial experiments looking at activation and steady state inactivation curves indicated good stability of the recording over time, we wanted to assess the stability of currents at partially inactivated voltages in more detail. To this end, we calculated the block produced by addition of buffer during the depolarized holding potential heat map of the fractional current shows four areas of patch plate where currents were substantially reduced. The areas of reduced currents coincide with the location of four ground electrodes situated underneath the patch plate. And the impact of such non-uniformity on concentration response curve for trucks is illustrated in B. Uh, considering that silver silver chloride is a major component of ground electrodes and also based on previous reports of T-type calcium channel block by silver ions, we hypothesized that the non-uniformity seen in our recordings may be caused by silver ions coming off the ground electrode. Therefore, we evaluate the effect of two silver salts on block of N-type calcium current. The block by silver chloride is shown at the top, in the top row A and B and blocked by nitrate at the bottom, C and D. Both salts block anti-calcium currents with IC50 of approximately 0.5 micromolar, and the block was not state dependent. We next explored the potential for chelation of silver by DMPS, a heavy metal chelator approved for clinical use in cases of heavy metal poisoning. It, was high, uh, it has high affinity for silver, and relatively low affinity for calcium and magnesium. At high concentration, DMPS applied in the extracellular solution blocked anti-calcium currents with approximately five millimolar IC50. However, addition of one millimolar DMPS to the buffer completely prevented block of calcium currents by silver nitrate without significant effects on anti-calcium currents themselves. We next tested the effect of DMPS on the stability of anti-calcium currents in Ironworks Barracuda concatenated protocol. Addition of DMPS to our solution reversed the loss of current over the ground electrodes as shown in the bar graph. It was the most effective when DMPS was added to both internal and external solution. DMPS prevented the loss of current during the buffer addition and resulted in uniform distribution of current calcium currents as shown in the heat map uh, of the fractional current. Uh, to examine potential effect of DMPS on the pharmacology of anti-calcium currents, we titrated a set of well-characterized calcium channel blockers in the presence of DMPS. IC50 values obtained on Einberg's Barracuda in the presence of DMPS generally agreed well with the published data suggesting that DMPS does not alter channel pharmacology. Uh, in summary, the voltage control of Einberg's Barracuda seems to be sufficient for evaluation of compound action on controlled conformation of ion channels at steady state. Uh, the limitations of Einberg's Barracuda remain in sub ohm seal, lack of signal conditioning, limited liquid handling capability, and in some cases, toxicity of components of recording apparatus. Uh, in a broad sense, um, the incremental advances in automated electrophysiology continue to expand our ability to investigate ion channel drug targets in great detail and increased throughput. Uh, before I end, I just want to acknowledge uh, that all this work has been performed with support of Eli Lilly and company. Uh, Mark did most of the Ironworks Barracuda recording, Mike all of the manual patch, and Birgit was the key, the key to wrap up this project. Um, 
we also had the access to general expertise in the Ironworks Barracuda, in particular, uh, Yuri Kurishev from Chantez, Dave Rock from Essen, and several colleagues from molecular devices, Jim Costantin, uh, Shin Young, and in particular, Ed Fernand. Uh, so I appreciate your time and interest, and I'm passing the control over to David. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, that's very nice data and presentation. So in my presentation, I want to show you um, a couple of uh, channel validation data on the next generation of the uh, automated patch clamp system, iFlux system. So the purpose of this uh, study was twofold. One is to support the SIPA has the high throughput screening uh, efforts uh, across different sites on different platforms, generate validation data, the second fold is that we want to test the feasibility of using iFlux um, HT system in screening of the voltage gated uh, ion channel compounds because we know that this platform is um, very good at the, the ligand gated ion channel uh, compound screening, but we want to test the feasibility of whether we can use this for uh, voltage gated ion channels. But before I go into the details of the data, I want to spend a couple of slides to briefly introduce you what we do, who we are, and what we do. Uh, European Scientific is a global company as actually a leading uh, CRO serving mostly three, mainly three uh, different industries. The fit test, the bathroom pharmaceutical test, and environmental test. And we are leading actually number one service providers in most of the fields in these three different industries. And now we're getting into the diagnostic industry too. Uh, we are established in 1987 as European Scientific, and now as of the year of 2015, we have around 225 lives left in 39 countries. Uh, we have roughly 23,000 uh, full-time employees, and we have over, over 150,000 analytical methods available for the customer. The subsidiary or the business units that uh, the Einstein Services uh, team was in is actually European Pharma Discovery Services. And this business unit was created by the integration and um, acquisition of three different legacy companies. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 2012, the, the European acquired the Lexi Pan Labs. In 2013, uh, the Lexi Syrup and combined them into European Syrup Pan Labs in 2013-2014. In the year of 2014, uh, the Europeans acquired the, the Lexi uh, Merck Millipore or EMD Millipore Discovery and Development Solution Business Unit and take part of that and then um, integrate that into uh, the business units that we're in now, which is called Europeans Pharma Discovery Services. And here shows the global footprint and the map of the, the European uh, Farmer Discovery Services. We have a site in St. Charles, Missouri, uh, which is the Ion Channel Service Team is located in. And we have a site. Uh, at, at the site here, we also have the, uh, the Uncle Panel Services, the, the Immuno Signaling Services, and as well as the Emitoxia Services. And we have a site in uh, Dundee, Scotland, which uh, is a home for the the kinase profiler services, and we have a, a site in uh, Poitiers, France, which is a legacy syrup site. It's a home for a lot of in vitro assays as well as some cellular assays there too. And we also have a site in Taipei, Taiwan, uh, which is a legacy pan lab site. Um, they specialize in a lot of vivo, in vivo pharmacology tests as well as some in vitro assay as well. So like I said, by com combination of all these different uh, legacy services units that make us a full service provider that can cover your needs from the very beginning of your target identification and validation until your compounds go goes into the, the clinical trials. Um, and I want to give you a brief introduction about CPA before before I go into the actual data. So late 1990s and early 2000s, we have a lot of compound withdrawal from the market. 
due to the Forsart risk. And uh, the scientists in the pharmaceutical industry and academia actually figured out this is largely due to the, the herd blockage or herd inhibition um, in the uh, cardiac tissue. And uh, HERGO refers to a human interdogo related gene uh, channel, and then uh, the, ch the, the, the current is referred to as IPR, and channel also refers to as QB11.1. So we know that the blockage of HER can lead to a cardiac action potential duration prolongation and EADs, and which can lead to the QT prolongation and eventually a pro risk, max risk, or to start. So all these findings lead to the implementation of the SDH 7B and C14 guidelines early in the 2000s. And this herc centric strategy that we're using is very effective and somewhat successful because the evidences are since the implementation of these guidelines uh, from 2000, early 2000, there's no drugs actually removed from the market due to the Tosard or Prurismic risk. But the problem here is we have a HERC inhibition compound collection. We have a QT prolongation compound collection. This all represents a large collection of the compounds or the other drug candidates. But the actual compounds that has the potential prorismic or Torsart risk only represents a very small subset of these compound collections. So this leads to um, the strategy is not very specific and leads to a lot of unnecessary early compound nutrition during our uh, drug discovery and de development process. So this leads to the CEPA paradigm or the CEPA initiative. So now we're looking to, there's multiple cardiac ion channels. We know that QT prolongation doesn't equal to prorismia risk or tosart risk. HERG inhibition doesn't equal to prorismia or tosart risk. The good evidence, is, or, uh, evidence or example is that Prozac or verapamil blocks HERG, will also inhibit the CAP1 to the L-type currents at roughly the same concentration, and then they are cardiac safe. And then there's other examples of these compounds too. So the basic idea is that you have a fine balance of inhibition uh, between the inward currents and the out outward currents actually that cancels out the effects of each other. So um, our HERG-centric or HERG-only focus has a very negative impact on the drug development, uh, as I just told you. It caused unnecessary early compound nutrition and caused a lot of um, potential of losing good drugs. So that, thus we have this new paradigm of cardiac safety evalu evaluation, which we call CEPA, Comprehensive In Vitro Prorismia Assay, which basically contains uh, three different approaches. One is that we uh, test the effects of the test compounds on multiple cardiac ion channels, and then we feed all this data into a computerized in silico uh, model re reconstruction to predict the, the risk of a prorismia pre or tosart. And then we, we test the compounds in the uh, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes um, model to confirm this finding. Actually, the, another, another aspect of this is then we confirm the finding in the uh, early clinical trial data. So what's, what are the candidates for the current? Like, like I just told you, for the current candidate, we want to look, in, look into the cardiac ion channels that has a, uh, that can balance out the outward current inhibition and inward current inhibition. So we have, before we have HERC-centric, HERC-centric strategy, which has the HERC blockage, and now we're discussing about the possibility of a sodium fast current and sodium late current um, test in the L-type CAP1-2. And also the candidate, uh, we also have qb long qt qb 7.1 link channel, and QR21 erective fire channel. But we are still in discussion about what, what's the final list of the channels that we're going to test and include into this cardiac uh, current candidates. For uh, this particular study, I'm going to just show you a validation data on three different channels. So the sodium 1.5, both the pick current and late current. Uh, the HERD channel, and uh, as well as the CAP12 channel on the ion So I want to no mention that actually here at the Eurofence Ion Channel Service Team, we offer a monthly service that we test eight different cardiac ion channels on the AdWorx Quattro and Menu Patch Clamp to, to evaluate the, uh, the multi-channel effects on the cardiac ion, channel, uh, ion, ion channels. And we are currently also validating these currents or channels on multiple ion channel platforms, which includes the Ion Flux platform, 
I'm going to show you in just a little bit. Here I want to show you a brief, a little a video uh, introduce you the, the platform. So Einflux HT platform was a plate-based microfluidic design that the plate was defined or divided into 32 different recording patterns. In each recording pattern, you can see that we have eight compound wells, two compound wells for internal solution, and one well for a cell. And then the plate was inserted into the uh, platform and everything was controlled by the pressure. There's no moving parts. Uh, the compound, the cell addition, or the cell flow, the, the, the introduction of internal solutions and introduction of your test compounds are all controlled by the pressure to ensure the fast introduction and removal of all the components, particularly test compounds. So the cells are flowing by the, driven by the pressure, and then we apply a negative pressure on the trap, which are the top two panels that you can see on this video, and then to attract the cells into the traps. And then after that, after the seal was obtained, you can see that we can apply another bigger pressure to, to obtain uh, the, the uh, wholesale recording and then you start uh, profusing GABA on the different recording traps, and you can see that the traces show you a dose-dependent response of the GABA. I've noticed that on, the, on your computer screen, there might be a little bit lag on the, uh, on the video. Uh, which actually later on you're going to have the PDF version of the slide deck and you can also uh, watch this video on the YouTube. So like I just told you, the Einflux HT system is a microfluidic plate-based design, so it gives you a lot of flexibility in the assay development and design, uh, and as well as a very fast, super fast actually, compound reintroduction re and removal within 100 milliseconds, also temperature control, and as well as the um, individual cell trap recordings that you can test multiple targets on the same plate. First, we validated the, the hacker channel on the Einflux HT. In this set of experiment, we, we look into different aspects of the experiment. First is the current stability. Uh, we test the time match vehicle control throughout the course time course of the recording to make sure that the, the current round down is minimal because as you know, the current round down might be a problem for your potency evaluation because the reduction of your signal even without introduction of the compound is a problem. Uh, you can't do a, a round down correction whether it's linear or exponential, but sometimes we know that just by adding the compound it causes a unpredicted uh, drop of the current. So we want to make sure that our current recording is very stable across the, 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 the time period that we're applying the compounds. And then we test a couple of reference compound pharmacology on the cells to make sure that they're, they agree with the historical data in-house and the published literature data. And then we test the intra-round variability on different days on the same reference compound to make sure that our assay is robust enough. And all this data was generated on the Eurofence Precision HEC herd cell lines. And we also did a cross-platform correlation, uh, compare the data collected from the Einflux to the Q-Patch. On this slide, you can see we use a pretty standard uh, HERC voltage protocol. And the upper panel, you see the current stability, the current throughout the recording time period is pretty stable. I show you three representative lines. And on the bottom panel, you see the C surprise, the baseline recording is very stable, and then after that, you have a very nice um, step-like step step -like dose-dependent response of C surprise by adding higher and higher concentration of C surprise. And towards the end, you have a nice washout because the, the, the solution is a continuous perfusion and solution exchange rates on this platform is really fast. And then we test a couple of reference compounds on the heart channel. We test as Amazole, Cisopride, E4Z31, Cephalidine, and as well as the time match vehicle control. And you can see that all the reference compounds, the potency data, is actually it's really close uh, to reported many patch plant data and the vehicle control 
uh, shows minimal runtime across the, uh, the the time of period of the reporting. In the next set of experiments, we look into the intraday precision to test the robustness of the assay. We pick three compounds, Cisoprize, s to Tefanidine, as well as high match vehicle control, and test those on two different days. You can see they, between day one and day two, the IC50 value is really close to each other. Uh, show that uh, our assay on the influx, the HERG assay on the influx is very uh, robust. Then we compare the potency value of the reference compound between Q-patch and influx. You can see that they both agree with each other, and the time match vehicle control looks uh, very good with minimal rundown, current rundown. Next couple of slides, I'm going to show you some sodium-1,5 uh, data on the influx. Again, we look into the current stability with time match vehicle control. We look into some reference pharmacology of the reference compounds. And we also look into the late current pharmacology uh, induced by the ATX2 and blocked by ranolazine. And again, all the data was generated with the Eurofins precision that, uh, cell line, NAP15, in the hex background. In this slide, you can see I show you use a two course protocol to test the state dependency. Uh, of the test compounds. Um, in Rock's presentation, he already, he already explained that the state dependency of the blockage, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. But you can see, our, again, our vehicle control shows a very stable response across the time of the recording, and then you have a very nice step response of lidocaine as you uh, apply higher concentration of lidocaine and then until fully blockage of top concentration. And then after that, you have a full reversal or washout of the lidocaine blockage effects and bring the current back down to the baseline level. And you can see that the lidocaine shows the post one IC50 of, of 737.9 close to one millimolar. And the second pulse shows IC50 of 82.7 shows a very uh, state dependent inhibition of lidocaine which also, again, this data agrees with the uh, literature values. Then we do the same thing across all the human NAV receptors we have in-house. Uh, we have NAV11 through 18. But here, the only difference is that we actually use a usage-dependent pro protocol. We use a 20 post protocol to test the usage or frequency dependency of the test compounds. Uh, we use either, either tetracaine, lidocaine, or uh, ABBA compound for the NAV18. So NAV11, you see there's a um, usage dependency between post 1 and post 2, or uh, post 20 for the potency data, and similar uh, findings on the NAV12. And uh, on the lower panel, you can see vehicle control, time match vehicle control of each uh, receptor or channel, and show you minimal uh, current rundown throughout the reporting. Here's the data for 1, 3, and 1, 4. Again, the, the potency value agree with the published literature value as well as our in house data. 1.5 and 1.6, and 1.7 and 1.8. On that 1.8, I want to uh, draw your attention to this ABBA compound. It's known to, it's very difficult to get the potency value down to low nanomolar range on the automated patch client platforms um, for this ABBA compound on the NAP 1.8. Um, but in here, I show you that actually due to the fast solution exchange and continuous perfusion feature of the influx, we can actually uh, get the, uh, the potency value down to the low nanomolar range. And here you see the vehicle control um, data. The, the baseline response is very stable across the time. The so next couple of slides, I want to show you uh, MAP15 late current reporting. Uh, first, what we do is, again, uh, on the top panel, this is the baseline response. And then we add different concentrations of ATX2 and you can see there's a nice dose-dependent response. And then on the lower left panel, you see that's the vehicle control with um, little to no late currents. And then on the right panel, you see there's a dose-dependent response, ATX2 induced late current. And we compare the influx potency value to the Q patch, and they are very close to each other. Um, and, and uh, as well as agree with the historical values and published publish later, literature values. And we also use the temperature control feature of the influx system, test the, the ATX2 compounds at 37 degrees, 
and room temperature, and we didn't see their supplementary shift between these two different temperatures. We have another cell line with beta-1 uh, auxiliary units, and we, we want to test that. So again, we do the same ex similar experiments, induce ATX2 to do a dose response, um, dose, dose response, and you can see the, the baseline response. Again, it's very stable. And then if you introduce a different concentration of ATX2, it shows a very nice step-like uh, dose-dependent response. And again, here's the vehicle. Here's the um, those dependent induced late currents by the ATX2. Uh, similar comparison, we do 37 degree on the ion flux room temperature and compare that with the Q-patch. There's a shift between Q-patch potency values and ion flux, but we don't see a temperature dependent shift on the potency of ATX2 on the NAP15 beta 1 cell line. And next, I want to show you that we can block this ATX2 induced uh, late currents by ranolazine, which is a known late current blocker. Um, again, you see here's the baseline response. And then we, we use ATX2 to induce the late currents, and we use different concentrations of ranolazine to block it. You can see there's a nice dose dependent blockage of the late currents with uh, washout reversal. And we compare the potency value again between the ion flux and the Q patch, and the potency value is really close across different platforms. So in the next set of experiments, I want to show you some uh, preliminary preliminary data we have on the CAF12 cell line. The CAF12 cell line was known the uh, technical challenge or difficult on the high throughput uh, automated patch plan, uh, platforms, mostly due to the current stability or current round down. Um, here I want to show you with ion flux that we can get a very stable baseline response of the uh, time edge vehicle control. Uh, historically, well, the way we're dealing with the current round down of CAP12 is actually on the Quattro we use a perforated patch. And uh, Quattro is probably shows the, the, the best or, or with a minimal current round down compared to other true wholesale current recordings, such as uh, Patch Express, QPatch, or other wholesale uh, automated patch plan uh, systems. Actually, right now, when people are dealing with round down uh, problems of CAP12, um, um, even on the QPatch or Patch Express or other wholesale patch plan systems, uh, we actually also try perforated patch instead of uh, wholesale recording. Uh, but here, I want to show you some very exciting preliminary data actually on single hole recording modes, which is the upper panel, and population modes, which is the lower panel, and the superimposed uh, calcium currents over different time, that they are pretty stable uh, throughout the reporting time period, which is about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, with min minimal current around down. And it, actually, this reporting was uh, achieved by uh, wholesale reporting. This is very exciting, and uh, we're continuing to test on pharmacology uh, of the reference pharmacology of CAP12. On this slide, I want to show you the capabilities of the Unchanneled Service Team here at the Eurofence uh, Panlabs. We have a couple of menu patch clamp break. We have uh, Q patch. Uh, system here. We have several Ironworks Quattro system as well as the Ironflux HT system I just showed you. We also have a high content image express system as well as the XGL Mastro system, which we currently use for uh, kind of model size MEA recording. Uh, we also have a couple of plate readers for fluorescent signal readings and as well as uh, a lot of liquid handlers for lab, lab automation. With that, I want to thank you for your time and audience, and um, thank you very much. If you have questions, you, you can ask now. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Big thank yous to Dr. Wei and Dr. Cern for bringing that information to us. Before we get started with all your questions, here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll get to as many as we can today. In addition, I want to remind our audience that you'll be seeing some polling questions appearing on your screen in just a moment. If you could take a little time to answer them so that we may make sure we're bringing you the most relevant information possible, we'd be 
very appreciative of that. Now, we will get right to our first question. Uh, our course, first question is for David. What role do you see the ion flux instrument filling in the SEPA investigations beyond HERG? Um, that's a good question. Actually, that's the reason why we want to test and validate all these different cardiac ion channels on the, on the ion flux. So based on the plates and microfluid design, like I said in the presentation, people thought this platform is ideal for the ligand-gated ion channel. So this, this, this set of studies actually particular to validate the, the feasibility of using this platform to test voltage-gated ion channels. And now we see that actually it is feasible and suitable to test all different uh, cardiac ion channel, voltage-gated ion channels on this system. So definitely we can use this for SIPA test. Uh, other than other platforms that we can use for CPA uh, ion channel targets as well. Great. We do have another question also for David. Why do you normalize the peak current? Um, the peak current, so it's, it's, it's a, a time, a cumulative, a, a, cumulative, a, a cumulative addition of the compound, so we have to normalize that to the baseline. This is continuous perfusion and very mimicking the, what we do on the menu patch clamp. And the other part of this is for the CAF-1-2, as you know, run, current rundown is a big problem. So we want to make sure throughout the, the time course of the recording or, or redu reduction of the current amplitude without the, without the compound addition is minimal because otherwise you might have an unexpected and unpredictable uh, potency shift of your test compound. I see. Okay. Another question, David. What can cause the current to be non-standard between concentrations if the concentrations are added sequentially and on the same cells? Um, that's a good question. Actually, that's a different system design compared to, compare ion flux to maybe ionworks quattro or maybe ionworks barracuda is that uh, the quattro and barracuda is a planar-based system and ion flux Einflux HT system is actually a microfluidic uh, based system, so actually everything is dynamic. Uh, once you trap the cells on the side of the wall instead of on the planner on the floor, uh, you have continuous perfusion and compound addition all the time. So if you introduce a, compound, a new compound concentration with high pressure, actually you might have a risk of losing cells on the traps because I just showed you on the Einflux system, you have two traps, each recording pattern, and each trap can record up to 20 cells. But those 20, 20 traps, 20 cell traps, are maybe fully or partially occupied by the cell. And if you use a high pressure to induce a new test compound solution, you might have a danger to lose the cell, which, which leads to a, a, a decrease in the cell quality or cell resistance and leads to the, the, the change in the current response. I see. Okay, we have another question. What is the volume range of the microfluidics transfer to the cell well for each instrument or compound and washout as well? Um, depends on your pressure setting. Tip, with typical pressure settings on this platform, you can add 50 microliters of test compound into each well which if you use that for continuous perfusion, it actually can last you up to hours, which is another benefit of this platform. It really reduced the, uh, the consumables, the use, use of the test compounds as well as the, the buffer. I see, okay. Our next question is for Rock. Now that you've optimized the assay for NAV 1.7 and CAV 2.2, are you screening? Can you approximate your throughput? Um, we developed those assays in parallel with screen and then use them as a follow-up only. Uh, but in general, Ironworks Barracuda is capable of screening, and we looked into a few possibilities, uh, but then ended up doing only small-scale screens with less than 10,000 compounds. Uh, and this is mostly due to the cost per data point and the fact that in our pilot screens, uh, in those particular targets, we did not see substantial advantage of, of Barracuda over less expensive assays, such as Flipper. Uh, the throughput, um, uh, that depends largely on the type of assay. For example, 
For some of the ligand gated channels, we were able to run up to 15 plates a day. Um, and those protocols were using relatively moderate uh, voltage clamp at uh, minus 80 millivolts, and they were relatively short, around 10 minutes. Uh, but for the concatenated protocols that I showed earlier, uh, the throughput was a bit lower. So on typical experimental day, we would run about uh, six plates. Okay. Our next question also for you, Rock. How do you see Ironworks Barracuda fitting into the FDA's new SEPA initiative? Is there anything unique about the instrument capabilities that would help? Um, to my understanding, SEPA is still evolving, and, uh, and Barracuda could, uh, as, as, as I see it, uh, could profile all of the ion channels that are currently considered as part of SEPA initiative. Uh, I could not comment on the predictive value of Barracuda versus other automated electrophysiology instruments, and I also don't know what uh, the acceptance of Barracuda by the regulators would be. But based on our experience, uh, I would be surprised if there are any large differences between Barracuda and other, uh, such as GigaCL uh, instruments. Small differences are expected considering that each instrument carries some limitations. For example, Barracuda may have a hard time accommodating um, simulation of cardiac uh, action potential protocol. Uh, Barracuda may have a little bit lower seal and not as accurate voltage clamp. But on the other hand, Barracuda has a substantial advantage in higher success rate, at higher throughput. It is very versatile. And one great thing that we observed is preservation of intracellular milieu because it uses amphotericin and perforated patch. I see. Okay, another question for you, Rock. How early in your drug development process are you performing HERG and SEPA assays? Um, we, um, we're relatively slow. So uh, we assess compound properties in silico initially. And in general, prior to selecting the lead molecules, we would conduct only a limited amount of HERG testing which typically involves both binding and functional assays. And this may differ if we see a HERG liability. Uh, we may go a little bit more intense. Uh, the profiling of compounds on other ion channels in potential SIPA panel uh, varies. And in general, we would conduct uh, mostly testing on NAV15 and L-type calcium channel. Um, now, as far as the automated patch in general, overall, the advent of automated electrophysiology drastically increased the throughput of, F of electrophysiology-based assays. And in general, the quality of the data obtained on automated electrophysiology is accepted, even for final compound potency determination. And as such, automated electrophysiology delivered on its objectives. Uh, a bit of problem is the cost of profiling and then there are specific liabilities of each chemical series, and that together necessitate more limited and more customized approaches. And for that reason, I don't anticipate a massive screening of compounds in panel of CPI assays early in the project. Uh, where I do see uh, more role of uh, high throughput screen in electrophysiology is for those targets where such approach gives you an advantage, for example, um, stay dependent blockers of voltage gated uh, sodium channels. I see. Okay. It's looking like we have time for one more question. Uh, our last question why the delays in the maximum of effect? Um, I don't know, David, is that for you or me? Uh, question did not specify. No. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, if it is for me, uh, and looking at the concatenated protocols, there is a kinetic uh, um, approach to uh, looking at the compound effect. And uh, a lot of these compounds, particularly the sulfonamides, they have very slow uh, kinetic of uh, binding. Uh, so that would be, uh, but I did not understand really the question in its fullest. I don't know what was meant to be delaying maximum effect. Okay. 
I'd just like to ask Dr. Wei and Dr. Cern if they have any final comments for our audience since we are done with our questions now. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a specific question for the audience, but I would really comment that uh, automated electrophysiology got a really long way, and I can still see progress. So it's really exciting time to be part of it. Yes, I agree. I think the new evolution or evolving of the new next generation of the ECS platforms uh, that like we showed today and some others on the market um, shows increased the field quality, increased throughputs, decrease in the cost per data point. So uh, we, we have yet to see um, a larger role that these platforms are going to play in the discovery workflow. Thank you again both for bringing this important information to us. If we didn't get to your question today, we will definitely follow up with you with more information. We also want to thank Molecular Devices for sponsoring today's event. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November of 2016. You'll be receiving an email from LabRoots alerting you when it's available for on-demand and posted on LabRoots.com. You're welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in with us live today. Thank you for logging on and participating in today's interactive broadcast. We hope to see you again next time. Goodbye. <laughs>